We want to call to order Thursday, January 30, 2020 work session. The first item is the approval of the agenda. Can I entertain a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. It's been moved by Ms. Shea. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Kinsella. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 The agenda is approved. Our next item on the agenda is for us to go into closed session. A public meeting for discussion of matters covered under items A1 and A2 of section 2.2-3711 of the Code of Virginia 1950. The assignment, appointment, performance, disciplining, and release of contract for specific school board employees, including the evaluation of the superintendent, the admission and discipline of specific students, <coughs> including a request for religious exemption from compulsory attendance. Can I enter a motion for us to enter into closed session? So moved. It's been moved by Mrs. Ogborn. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Atkins. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 We are now in closed session. We want to call back to order the work session. Um, can I have a motion to certify that only items that were on the agenda were discussed in the closed session. So moved. It has been moved by Ms. Shea. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Ogburn. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you so much. We're going to turn the meeting <laughs> back over to our superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. For the first item this afternoon, um, I'm recommending that the school board um, hear from our Christmas mother. And we have um, Henri Henri um, Andrea Collins here she is the 2019 Henrico Christmas mother, and she is going to come forward to share a report that reflects our involvement and, and contributions to the Henrico Christmas mother campaign. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Cashwell and our colleagues. I am pleased to share with you the results of the 2019 Henrico Christmas Mother campaign. Students and staff enthusiastically participated, contributing $11,224 in monetary donations, new books, toys, apparel, and toiletries valued at $24,000, and approximately 104,000 food items collected valued at $155,775. In the Brooklyn District, for example, Greenwood Elementary collected more than 4,400 food items. Brooklyn Middle in the Fairfield District collected just over 2,400 cans of food. Pocahontas Middle in the Three Chop District collected money, food, and gifts valued at more than $21,000. From the Tuckahoe District, Godwin High School students donated nearly 8,000 food items, and Highland Springs High School in the Verina District reported in more than 1,200 cans of food. And one new addition to this year's donation were 200 wooden toys handmade by students in career and technical education classes, valued at $600. Now, this collective spirit of giving resulted in an overall donation total of $191,060. And at this time, I'd like to welcome in the 2019 Henrico Christmas mother, Andrea Collins, to bring us some remarks. Andrea, on behalf of all of us here at Henrico County Public Schools and the school board, I'll be the first to say thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the school board, Dr. Cashwell, and colleagues, on behalf of the Henrico Christmas Mother Council, I would like to thank you for your support from the students, the parents, the teachers, the staff that they provided for our program this year. We had another amazing year of giving, and we are so grateful. We are also thankful for the weather that it cooperated this year, unlike last year, and that Andy did not have to bring out his school, clo school closing techniques that he often has to do. Uh, this made for an easy five days of distribution of the gifts um, that we were able to give to provide for our families this year. This year, we had a total of 1,492 families that, we, that were approved for assistance. That's over 4,395 individuals that received help. Um, the total number of children birthed to senior in high school was 2,364. All families with children received food, food gift cards for perishable items, clothing, books, and toys. Your donations also helped 732 seniors and disabled adults with a variety of gifts, food, and food gift cards. Late this fall, I had the opportunity to attend many of the school assemblies and was impressed by the enthusiasm of the students giving to their Henrico neighbors in need. 
I was also impressed by the creativity of the principals and staff at these schools for providing the opportunity to understand the power of kindness and giving in a fun and exciting way. We crowned lots of turkey queens and can champions in the months of November and December. On December 3rd, the Christmas Mother Council was excited to welcome the equity ambassadors to our warehouse. Many of the students paired thousands of socks and literally tons of cans of food to sort, box toys, among many other duties to get us ready for the first days of shopping for our families. Because of the partnership that we have with Henrico County Public Schools and Henrico County General Government, the Henrico Christmas Mother can provide food and gifts to make the holidays happier for our Henrico families. We are so appreciative of all that you do for us and we cannot support the community in the way that we do without, without all of your help. We are so very thankful. We hope that you have a wonderful 2020. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be happy to take any questions that the board may have. Well, we want to say, first of all, for myself, and I give my peers an opportunity, thank you for your dedication and your sacrifice, not only you, but also your peers. Um, because of you, an indelible mark has been left on the community. So thank you so much. Anyone else want to say anything? I do. I, I had the opportunity to come down and visit and walk through, and I also want to say job well done organizationally. It was phenomenal. Thank you. And on behalf of many of my community who I know received some of the services from there, thank you. You're very welcome. We, we really do enjoy what we do. It's, it's fun. It's an all year um, effort for a lot of us, um, but um, it's really rewarding to, um, to have the families come in and, and shop like they do and it, you know, have them have a little dig dignity and grace to pick out those um, uh, toys and, and and other things for their families. So um, it's, it's a, a project that I've enjoyed for a lot of years. So we appreciate all that the help that, that all the community provides for us because we really couldn't do it without all that help. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. We thank you very much. Thank you. All right, for the next item, the superintendent is recommending the ex, um, expulsion um, of student case number 19-20-S-7. And I would um, just note for those who may have been following along with the previously published agenda that I have withdrawn my recommendation for the expulsion of student 19-20-S-6. So again, right now I'm requesting the expulsion of student 19-20-S-7 and for violation of the code of student conduct and his name is his or her name is protected under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. Board members, you have heard the recommendation of the superintendent. Do I have a motion to accept her recommendation? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Ogburn. Is there a second? Second. Been seconded by Ms. Kinsella. All those in favor say aye. 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 Superintendent's recommendation has been approved. Thank you. I'm also recommending the expulsion of student case number 19-20-S-8 for violation of the Code of Student Conduct. Again, name is protected under the Virginia, Virginia Freedom of Information Act. Board members, you have heard the superintendent's recommendation. Do I have a motion for acceptance? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Atkins. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Shea. All those in favor say aye. Aye. The action is approved. Thank you. Thank you. I'm also requesting an alternative placement in an alternative education program for student 19-20-S-8. Board members, you have heard the superintendent's recommendation. Do I have a motion for acceptance? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Kinsella. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Ogburn. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, I'm, I'm seeking your consideration for the readmission of student 18-19-S-4. Board members, you have heard the recommendation from the superintendent. Is there a motion to accept her recommendation? So moved. Been moved by Ms. Atkins. Second. And seconded by Ms. Shea. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Ayes have it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, I'm recommending that the school board approve the request for release from compulsory attendance for student case number 19-20-RE-4 based on bona fide religious beliefs. 
Board members, you have heard the superintendent's recommendation. Is there a motion to accept? So moved. So moved by Mrs. Ogburn. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Shea. All those in favor say aye. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. For the next item, Mr. Chairman. Madam Vice Chair, members of the school board, I'll be providing a progress report on what has been called um, Amy's Passport, Travels, Reflections, and Next Steps. Um, as you know, the passport was first stamped back in the summer of 2018 when I was just getting to know Henrico County. The passport documented the many meetings, visits, and community engagements and opportunities for me to hear more about Henrico and for our stakeholders to learn a bit more about me. From there, in December of 2018, I outlined a series of recommendations and next steps to improve our already great school division. The first progress report was delivered in May of 2019, and today I'm sharing a second progress report officially, though this uh, progress report was uh, published just a bit before the winter break. Um, with everyone today. And before I uh, move on to share progress, I'd like to take um, a few minutes for some thank yous today. So I know um, as we've uh, made progress reports along the way, you all have seen the tremendous efforts that have gone into making progress with the goals stated in the passport. And that would not be possible, um, ladies and gentlemen of the board, without the people you see sitting right in front of you today. There's tremendous effort and energy that's taken place um, in each and every area of our um, school division, um, all the way into our school buildings with our leaders. But of course, uh, with us here today, we have the division leadership team and their entire supporting team sitting here and so um, I would like to thank personally each and every one of you for all the effort and energy that's gone into making um, progress and headway with so many of the goals that have already been marked complete and a number of which are underway and um, do require a tremendous amount of energy planning and effort and collaboration um, across all of, of your work groups so thank you for all that you've done to make this happen. All right, so let's take a minute to see some of the highlights. In the areas of teaching and learning, our focus was on literacy and ensuring that every school had the resources and staffing for struggling readers. You may remember that staffing school with teachers who possess expertise in teaching reading was extremely important, and so we hired five reading specialists for this current 1920 school year. More to come on what's next um, with the budget presentation, but elementary um, schools also received small group guided reading instruction uh, materials. Middle school English classrooms got classroom libraries that represented a variety of cultures and backgrounds. And high schools created themed text sets that support the high school literacy model. Additionally, staff members are building their understanding of how to develop personalized pathways for students, allowing for voice and choice. Teacher design teams are forming um, to aid teachers in shaping the vision for the design, delivery, and assessment of deeper learning. Not all students want to attend college, and we redesigned the academic and career planning process for pre-K through grade 12 to ensure that students and their families have a clear understanding of all of the pathways ahead of them. This was created based on feedback from the 2019 stakeholder survey. Um, and this year, the digital course planning guide, which includes interactive life ready learning pathways website was launched. Some of you may remember from a prior board experience wearing those virtual reality goggles as you got a sneak peek at what was ahead with some of these digital resources. And the first version is serving middle and high school students and families as they engage in the process for the 2020, 2021 course planning. Elementary health and physical educators are taking drug prevention to the next level by identifying and securing digital resources for substance abuse awareness and prevention. On the secondary side, educators met to identify and secure resources related to suicide prevention. Anonymous Alerts was uh, launched in August 2019 to empower students to raise healthy, um, to raise health and safety concerns confidentially. And not all students learn at the same level or speed, and we're cognizant of that. So we sought out to expand cor course off offerings for those who want a more rigorous course load. A comprehensive plan is being developed to increase enrollment and support for students to be successful in rigorous coursework. Innovation is the cornerstone of student-centered learning, and all high schools are now on the same block schedule with students having 
extended time for those authentic learning opportunities. Students have more opportunities for internships, apprenticeships, and classrooms now include flexible seating, which creates a more collaborative environment. When you think of high schools of the future, uh, we want the new Highland Springs High School and J.R. Tucker High Schools to come to mind. Both of those schools will be serving as catalysts for division-wide change from advisory programs and interdisciplinary courses to internships. So not just what you'll see on the outside with those shiny new buildings, but all of the amazing program that, programming that will happen inside the building. The STEAM program continues to go full steam ahead pun intended there, and every elementary school has access to STEAM instruction in the form of an innovative learning coach or a STEAM resource teacher. On to safety and instructional support services. Individual education programs exist in support of our students with special needs, and we recently conducted a survey to gather feedback from parents and guardians about their experience with the IEP process. And as the result of a multi, uh, as a result of this, a multi-year plan was developed that clearly outlines goals and outcomes related to a 2018 review of our special education programming which is to examine comprehensive and effective services, align instruction and access to a viable curriculum, reimagine the Virginia Randolph Education Center, and optimizing communication to maximize engagement. And this led us to examining the current model for mental health and trauma-informed care. Work groups were created to support implementation and maintenance of, a prof of professional learning and the resources. The Social, Emotional, and Academic Learning Team, also called the SEAL Team, is working to identify a vision and mission for sufficient mental health and trauma-informed care systems in our schools. We believe that Henrico County is a leader in efforts to improve equity and diversity within public education. On the curricular side, specialists are providing resources that promote multicultural awareness and are culturally relevant. All staff members, that's all staff members, are required to complete online training on cultural sensitivity annually, which was new for us uh, this 2019-20 school year. Human Resource is taking this uh, one step further by examining current practices to recruit and retain a diverse workforce based on recommendations that were made by the Equity and Diversity Advisory Committee. In organizational efficiency, we know the community plays a huge part in public education. The 2018 through 2025 strategic plan was revised and realigned, including connections to Amy's passport. The development of career ladders has been ongoing and is uh, nearly ready to launch with the next school year and will provide personalized learning pathways for our teachers and other employee groups. Our professional learning and leadership staff is actively having conversations with employee groups groups to determine their professional needs. Based on feedback from a focus group of principals and administrators, a more streamlined school improvement structure was put into place. This revised process will serve as a meaningful tool for managing and tracking measurable goals. Staffing models are being reviewed across the board. A work group of elementary administrators is analyzing our staffing models as well as those in other school divisions with similar enrollments. A different focus group of elementary staff and administrators is also evaluating the ratios of office clerical staffing within Henrico schools as well as that compared to other school divisions with similar enrollment. Elementary office clerical responsibilities and staffing models for all office staff are being assessed. Our new employee orientation also got a revamp. A new streamlined and very welcoming experience for new hires launched in June of 2019. Highlights include Saturday orientations, orientations at locations throughout the county, videos, banners, and snacks. Snacks are always a positive with any orientation, I think. Work has also begun on defining and purchasing a professional development management system to monitor teacher application, licensure, relicensure, and micro-credentialing. And finally, as it relates to financial planning, the facility study is finally complete, and those results were in and used as we developed a capital improvement plan that was presented for public review and later approved by the school board in fall of 2019, which helped us determine our long-term facility needs for the school division. 
Again, the full progress report you should have at your fingertips, and I'm realizing I don't think you do have it at your fingertips as I was speaking. We also have copies in the back, and I do see those there for those who may be in attendance, and we'll make sure um, those here uh, get those copies. Um, but again, the full progress report is available not only at your fingertips, but it exists online in case you haven't stumbled upon it before, and we'll continue to communicate using that electronic um, update through our newsletters, our social media, and when we're meeting with citizens face to face. So with that, our progress report is complete, but we know our work is not done. It continues and we look forward to another public update in the spring. And I'm happy to take any questions you may have. And again, apologize for not having the full version in front of you. It's okay. I think we can grab a few of those. Thank you so much, Dr. Coswell, for your uh, presentation. Are there any questions? I'll start to my right. Our statements? I don't really have a question. I just wanna, um, applaud you for your capital planning study and for the work you and your team are doing, uh, planning for our future um, five to 10 years from now. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go next. Um, thank you, Reverend Cooper. Um, I uh, especially want to acknowledge the, when going back to one of the, I don't remember which slide it's on about the literacy plan and checking across the county, doing an inventory of the materials that our teachers have and being sure that materials are, are distributed equally and that we have a baseline of materials for our teachers, which I know is a goal. And um, to just, we, you know, we've hired teachers, let's give them the resources that they need to do the job and also taking into account the PTA factor. You know, there, there are some schools that have PTAs that have purchased materials and others that don't and just, making sure that um, we make things equal across the county, which, I, and I agree with Ms. Kinsella, it's so important that we've done our facility study to make sure that we know where we stand and we can plan for the future. And having a five-year plan looking forward lets the county know our budgeting needs, and that is so critical for you know, prudent fiscal planning, but also so that our community is completely aware of, of what our needs are. I say this all the time, because where the, the schools go, the county goes, and we need to take care of the infrastructure. And knowing what we need is critical to, to doing that. So I, I think that was long overdue, and so glad that we have this device that we can use to communicate the future and the plans to the community. It's so transparent and so easily accessible and understood. So I kudos for putting it all together and for Andy and his team for their part in it. Can't leave that out. Thank you, Ms. Ogburn. I echo, I echo what Ms. Ogburn said and just applaud you and your team for the access and the transparency that this passport provides on um, where we're headed, uh, but also what we are accomplishing and, and where we have areas for growth. And so it's very accessible um, to the public and uh, that is important, and so I really appreciate you and your team's work. Thank you, Shay. I think it's always grand when individuals come together for a common goal. I think it's important, and I think Amy's passport is reflective of many individuals working together for a common goal, and that we have to always keep in mind while we're really here. And so Amy's passport is truly a passport to help us navigate through where we want to be and we want to be a county of excellence. So kudos to you and this entire team for working collaboratively to move forward in success. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Atkins. I concur with the comments that my colleagues have made. Um, Dr. Castro, we look forward to um, the continued innovation that this uh, passport affords us, as well as the continued alignment with our cornerstones, with our strategic plan, and with this livable document that's living and breathing and making a difference. So thank you so much. Thank you, appreciate the positive feedback. And um, as you can see, while we've got lots completed, there's an awful lot still in progress and so much energy and momentum, uh, again, around those common goals. So we look forward to bringing you the next update. All right, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the board, for the next item, I'm gonna have Mr. Sorensen um, come on up because we are going to share with you um, the recommended budget for fiscal year 2021. And so, um, as I noted, Mr. Sorensen's gonna join me and tag team a bit for this presentation. And before we get started um, sharing the, the budget information with you, I would like to recognize the entire budget team. And I think 
Debbie, Stephanie, and Maria are here. If they would stand, and Chris, along with uh, these three ladies and an entire team of folks we don't see here today, I want to thank them for the, their tremendous work um, as they've um, worked diligently to um, put together a tremendous budget. So thank you all for all your hard work. It's very much appreciated. All right, so I'm going to um, kick off the presentation by providing a bit of an overview, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Sorensen to walk you through some details, and then we'll look forward to taking your questions. So I want to share with you some of the details of our recommended budget for 2020-2021. As I've visited so many schools and spoken with many groups and individuals, I've gained a greater understanding of areas that need our investment and our continued investment. The budget um, that you're about to see really builds on the progress made in this year and continues to focus on the goals in our strategic plan. So what's in the recommended budget? Today, I'll share with you some of the highlights and what we need to continue to grow and thrive as a school division. So I have categorized a bit of this in the, with the term big wins, because when you think about um, some of the things that are underway and where we want to head, uh, I think that you'll see that a number of items within this budget are big leaps in the right direction, and we see them as big wins for Henrico County Public Schools. So our first big win is compensation. Earnings are always a priority in our budget, and this year is no exception. Our employees are the very best, and it's crucial to recognize them for their dedication. So a career ladder program is being funded and implemented, which enables staff members to climb and experience expertise and pay. Speaking of pay, you may be wondering about pay increases for fiscal year 21. Unlike our neighboring localities in Henrico, it's customary for employee raises for all school and government employees to be considered later on in the budget process. So I'll ask you to please stay tuned uh, for information this spring related to pay increases. More big wins include elementary school counselors, <laughs> elementary planning time, reading specialists, and library assistants. In survey responses, emails, and discussions with our stakeholders, I was told that we need to continue to provide more opportunities and support systems for both students and teachers alike. And we heard you. The recommended budget includes funding for an additional 40 counselors at the elementary level, which addresses a critical need among students for academic and social emotional support. Daily elementary planning time will also be included in the recommended budget as additional support such as counselors, innovative learning coaches, and library assistants uh, have been added so that master schedules can be adjusted accordingly to meet uh, building needs and ensure daily planning time. In the second year of a multi-year initiative to increase support for K-12 literacy, 15 reading specialists for elementary will also be included. And more wins, social emotional support staff, full-time instructional assistants for students with special needs, and substitute teachers. To help support our students and teachers even further, we have the addition of two psychologists, two social workers, and one exceptional education reading teacher. Addressing another critical need in the classroom is converting 25 exceptional education instructional assistants from temporary to full-time positions. This strengthens our support for students with special needs and provides these valued employees with full-time benefits. Another way we're addressing consistent coverage for our classrooms is the hiring of 35 full-time substitutes. All 35 positions will have higher salaries and full-time benefits in order to attract the best candidates. On the operations sides, we have wins in the form of a school bus tracking app, anonymous alerts, visitor registration software, and additional maintenance funding. The recommended budget includes funding for developing a school bus tracking app to allow parents to locate their students' bus in real time. Anonymous alerts, the emergency planning and response system is funded along with the updates to our visitor registration software. This budget also includes additional funding for building maintenance. So how did we get here? Well, that's why I'm gonna bring in Chief Financial Officer Chris Sorensen to review some additional details of our budget. Mr. Sorensen. All right. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell. Good afternoon, members of the board, uh, Mr. Chair. So as Kate, Superintendent said, I'm gonna walk through a couple of additional slides to talk about the budget process and give some more details of, of the budget. 
Um, so Superintendent mentioned in her comments that we, we're always receiving information. We're always seeking input so we can put together the best budget to meet our students and communities needs possible. Uh, this slide indicates some of the more formal pr processes that we have. We do go out in the fall to community meetings. And of course, the school board has a public input session in November, December. But these are only the formal. We're always getting information from our, our staff and community. So that, that occurs, the formal sessions occur in the fall. And um, while we're doing that, we're also working internally with our school staff and our county staff to put together base budgets to understand what they need and to exchange information, particularly between the schools and the county back and forth as we, as we work to today to, to build and help the superintendent build her budget. Um, so here we are today, uh, January 30th. I'll walk through the rest of the budget calendar at the end of my presentation to wrap up uh, the rest of the budget process. Do you want to talk about enrollment? Enrollment, of course, is, is critical for our budget. Um, a lot of our revenue, state revenue, is based on enrollment. And obviously, many of our expense, uh, expenses are based on enrollment, too. We have staffing ratios we need to meet, and about 88% of our budget is personnel related. So it, getting our enrollment correct is, is very important. This slide reflects the September 30th enrollments of the years indicated at the bottom of that chart. So I want to review the operating funds real quickly. We do have four operating funds. There's the general fund, and we spend most of our time talking about the general fund. As you can see from this slide, the general fund is $533 million, and so we, we spend most of our time focusing on that. But we also have a debt service fund. The debt service fund is how we pay off all the, the bonds and different borrowing mechanisms we have to uh, build our schools and expand our schools. The school nutrition fund is about $23.7 million in the proposed budget. That is a self-sustaining fund. It operates off uh, gener revenue generated by the school nutrition services, as well as some state and federal money in that as well. Which brings us to state and federal grants. Um, it's $57.6 million in the proposed budget. That some of the larger things you may be familiar with would be Title I, Title VI-B, Title II, Title III, Title IV, so all the title grants, as well as a lot of different state grants we have in that as well. And of course, those funds are all matched to specific programs, um, and we have to meet guidelines with those programs in order to receive that money. So those four operating budgets add up to $656.5 million. That is a $24.4 million increase over the current year's adopted budget. At the bottom of the slide, you see code RVA. We do disclose code RVA because it is in our accounting system, but we're just the, the fiscal agent for code RVA. They have their own, uh, they have their own school board. Obviously, you guys know that. But we do, since we do have their money in our accounting system, we want to disclose their budget on our slides. So this is a different way of looking at that same chart. Um, it, it shows the four funds. Current 2020 is on the left, and the recommended budget 2021 is on the right. You'll see that we're at $632.1 million now, and the recommended budget is 656.5. And this pie chart shows a little better while we spend so much time talking about the general fund. It is about 81% of all of our operating funds. So within our general fund, we do break out expenses into state mandated categories. So this breaks it out. You can see in both pie charts have instruction administration and attendance, pupil transportation, operations and maintenance and technology. As you would want to see with the school division, instruction is far and away the largest piece of that pie at 76%. The revenue, revenue we will update for you later on in the budget process. At this point, for the 2021 year, uh, we're showing a large slice of revenue from um, the county transfer. We simply don't have the information from the county yet, so we do have a holding place. The target increase you see at the top of $19 million, that will be spread out once the budget is finalized between the state portion and the county portion. Do you want to talk about the special revenue fund for just a couple minutes? There are some things in that that I want to point out to you. Again, these are primarily federal and state grants. Um, so the numbers is about a $5 million increase that I went through on the previous slide, and those because the grants have, have increased. Title II is the largest grant increase, about $2 million in that, in that fund. But we do want to point out that um, we have a special education regional classroom program. We do have 10 instructional assistants in that grant. So we're adding 25 to the budget in total, 15 in the general fund, and 10 in the special revenue fund. And then uh, Title I permanent subs, I just mentioned that Title I grants going up about $2 million. The superintendent mentioned that we're adding 35 permanent substitutes. Uh, 22 of those would be in Title I, and the balance would be in, in the general fund. So we did want to disclose there are some FTEs being added to the special revenue funds. 
So again, uh, today's January 30th. Obviously, the superintendent presented her budget to you guys. Uh, there are several steps we have to go through to complete the process. Staff will present this budget to the county manager next week on the 5th. We'll present it to TAC on February 12th. February 13th, you guys will hold a, a public hearing, for another opportunity for the public to comment on the budget. On the 27th, you will approve a budget. We'll send it to the county. At that point, it becomes part of the county's budget. On March 18th, staff will go back to the county to present to the Board of Supervisors. On April 14th, the county will have their public hearing, which can include comments on our budget at that point. April 28th, the county is scheduled to adopt their budget. It will come back to you guys in May. So on the 14th, you will adopt a budget, and then it will become effective July 1st. And I will be glad to answer any questions you all may have. Thank you so much, Mr. Sorensen. Um, school board members, you have heard a report from our superintendent as well as our um, chief financial officer. Are there any comments or questions starting to my left? Um, I just want to say just a, such a dynamite job, and I feel like this budget um, is really investing on what moves the needle for our students and supports our faculty. So I want to thank you, your team, and the superintendent for that. Um, I'm particularly giddy about the 40 counselors for the elementary school, Absolutely. getting that ratio closer to 250 to 1 alleviating the wheel, um, all kind of with the same solution while maintaining um, daily planning for our teachers. And I could go on about how I'm excited about so many other components, um, but I'll just say thank you for um, really prioritizing and investing um, investing in our students in a smart way. My turn. A um, couple years ago, uh, th Chris, I think it was before you were here actually, one of the things the board talked about in general was making sure that as we increase the budget we look at how can we have a direct impact on students and when I look at those first couple of slides the first one is you know obviously we're looking at um, compensation for our teachers where that's coming well, well hopefully that will we'll work it out but getting the career ladders going which is following up on a conversation that's been going on for a while now but if I, I look at all the new hires the new positions those are direct impact for the quality of life of our kids, and that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're not adding, and I'm not picking on administrators, but I, we're not adding fluff positions. Right. We're adding real impact-making positions, which I think is so important. And having 15 more reading specialists, I mean, I feel like I need to stop there, but having reading specialists in every school, teaching kids to read, all of those are very basic, very important things. And like Marcy said, having counselors that can do more than the paperwork that oftentimes counselors get saddled with. I just think we're making some really bold and important moves with this budget, so I'm very appreciative. Thank you, Ms. Ogman. Ms. So. Yes, thank you. Um, I would just like to say, I think overall, I think voices have been heard, whether we're addressing our full-time our full substitutes, whether we're addressing transportation with an app, um, whether we're addressing planning time, um, counselors, I mean, it's just reading specialists, all of this is just so exciting, and I appreciate um, the work of everyone on the team uh, bringing this forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I concur um, to uh, my colleagues' um, comments, especially when we talk about the physical structure of our, of our facilities, but also what's in our building and the, the, the definite the improvement um, and the identification. We talk about the correlation between our literacy plan, but then realizing that the current staffing structure does not necessarily necessitate you know, the implementation and changes we need. I think that we, we're analyzing, but we're also um, innovating in regards to the staffing model. So I'm excited, like everyone said. So we look forward to hopefully getting the pass and getting more money for our teachers as far as rates are concerned. All right, thanks for the comments. Thank and yeah, no doubt uh, the compensation piece will continue to be watching closely and we'll look forward to reporting back um, on that. I think there thank are you. no further questions. So thank you, Mr. Sorensen. All right, for the next item, um, Dr. Tigan's going to come forward to provide you an overview of class sizes at the elementary and secondary levels as of December 2019. Dr. Tigan. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Cashwell. Um, I am here this afternoon to share our class size data for 2019-2020 as um, Dr. Cashwell indicated that's based on a snapshot that was taken in December of this year. 
Decision ma decisions made during the master scheduling pr um, process play a pivotal role in class size. So I wanted to share a little bit. The process begins with the school level directors allocating initial staffing based on enrollment projections. The school level directors then monitor fluctuations in enrollment and make adjustments as needed. Regardless of the school level, the principals also must think about the unique needs of the students within their buildings, specifically the needs of students with disabilities, as well as our English language learners prior to starting the scheduling process. At the secondary level, principals must also consider that student voice. What is it that students want to take for their electives? It is important to note also that the standards of quality set the class size maximums for elementary at 24 for kindergarten, with the flexibility to increase to 29 with the presence of a full-time instructional assistant and up to 35 students in grades one through five. At the secondary level, the student load per teacher is 150 for most classes, which averages to 30 students per section. The exception to this is in health and physical science, I mean physical education, as well as our music teachers, where class, size, where class loads can go up to 200 students. I will say as well, there are limits on the other side. When those seem high, there's limits on the other side where um, with our career and technical classes, there are limits in some classes of 20 students per class based on safety concerns. With the basic information about master scheduling, let's look at our class sizes at the elementary level. This table provides a summary of the number of K-5 classes with more than 25 students, and the data is broken down by grade levels. This year, there are 15 classrooms that are above 25 students, whereas last year, there were 18, and the previous year, there were 33. Given that we have 1,129 classrooms across our 46 elementary schools, having 15 classes above 25 students means that we're meeting our target of 25 or fewer students per classroom 99% of the time as of December 2019. So I think that the data shows our efforts to monitor and make adjustments are paying off. The elementary directors monitor enrollment levels and realign staffing to meet grade level needs across the division through September 30th. As of September 30th, there were no general education classes above 25, but as families continue to move into and out of Henrico County, our class sizes continue to fluctuate. Here you can see the data by school and by grade level as of December. At the secondary level, the school level directors also monitored the class sizes and allocated the limited staffing available to the areas of greatest need. This table provides the number of core classes, and for core, we've defined it as English, math, social studies, and world language, and the number of non-core classes by middle school with enrollment of more than 30 students. There are 155 core classes and 332 non-core classes at the 12 middle schools with enrollment above 30. And this table provides that same data for our high schools. There are 233 core classes and 238 non-core classes across our nine high schools with enrollment above 30 students. And here's a table that provides a comparison of the number of classes with enrollment of less than 20 students and the number of classes with enrollment above 30 students. We examine the classes under 20 students as this does have an impact on our number of classes above 30 students. Classes under, 30, under 20 can occur when a CTE class that has a cap of 20 might be down a student or two as a result of families relocating. 
In addition, if only 18 students want to take AP Calculus at Verina High School, it is imperative that the students are not denied this opportunity to access rigorous coursework. Less than 5% of our core classes have enrollment above 30. I would like to note that 396 of the non-core classes above 30 are health and physical education classes, and 26 are music classes, which as you recall, have a threshold of 200 student um, maximum load. With health and PE and music removed from the 570 total above, approximately 5% of our non-core classes have enrollments above 30. And we are currently beginning the scheduling process for the 2020-21 school year. We continue to focus on best practices and to provide professional development to our administrators around master scheduling. We also continue to work with our planning department to monitor events outside Henrico that could impact our schools. One example of this might be the recent announcement about the demolishing um, Creighton Court. And while this will likely impact our enrollment numbers, it is difficult to predict the impact on individual schools prior to the start of the school year. And I am happy to respond to any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Tiger. I'm You're gonna start with my colleague, Ms. Ogburn. Thank you. A um, Couple years ago, when we had that number of 33 and it was higher before that, I remember us having a conversation of we've got to do something. So the fact that we're now to 15, two years later, I am so appreciative of really looking at this problem, especially at the elementary level where it's so critical and it's so difficult for teachers to have a large class. So the fact that we're at 15 at this point and we're still looking at this and we are still trying to get that number down, I think is tremendous progress in two years. Cutting that number let more than half is, is great. Um, I hope we are still doing that much work and working that hard at the, the middle school and high school level. If you don't mind, Debbie, can we go back to the middle school, Kathy, whoever does that. I'm sorry, I don't know who runs the button. But anyway, when I look at this list for core classes, which is where I'm mainly focusing, I look at my four middle schools and they all have larger numbers than I would like for our core classes. But having 30, I would love to have, if we could get some ad additional information, how big is over 30? Are we talking 31 or are we talking 36? I, I just would love that at some point in time. Don't have to have it, obviously, immediately, but I would like to know how, how big have we gotten in some places. I know that as we go through the redistricting process, this is one of the things that was driving the board's decision to go to redistricting is to even out some of these issues and hopefully that will have the the desired benefit um, but I'm real curious about that what's our max I, I, I will I get you like that information that. for the board um, but I would like to just throw out an idea I, don't, I would love to also know if there's something y'all could look into I know we have a state SOQ max of, of I think you said 35 for, for one through five what is it for middle school and high school, do you know, or can you get that information for us? They actually, in the, at the secondary level, it goes to teacher load rather than class size. Okay. Um, what, I was, what I'm interested in, we've talked about this over the years, of in, just putting in place possibly a Henrico County Max, and we've talked about looking at a, a definite, no more than whatever, we've talked about having class size limits at the elementary level and the secondary level. And that if we could get that conversation stirred up again, I know it has certain budget impacts because we would have to hire and we have to have classrooms to put all those kids in and not trailers. But um, so I would like for us to begin that conversation again, to look at class max um, numbers and see if it is possible for us to have, you know, let's say it's 35, whatever the number is that, and just get the input of the staff and Dr. Cashwell is to our class limits. I know other counties have gone this way and uh, we haven't set a number, we have the state number, but I would like to see us have a number that you know we just, we can assure our staff that you're not going over this many students and if we have a hot spot where we do have, you know, let's say there's 
you know, 40 kids signed up for a math class, we are now required. We're going to fix that problem. We won't let that teacher sit there with 40 students in their class. So just to start the conversation, I'd like to know how anybody else feels about that. But we've talked about this before. We've talked around it. I would like to see us talk a little more seriously about starting that process. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Kinsella. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Tigan, um, for your presentation. Um, I applaud this. This is going to sound ridiculous after coming off such uh, complimentary things after our budget conversation, but since this does follow budget, um, I'd like to support what Mrs. Ogburn has said and um, take it a step further. And once we identify the number that we'd like to move forward with, actually um, look at this as part of a phase in um, mm -hmm. three to five year potential budget um, priority. And, um, and look at getting this initiative um, as one of our top priorities. Because I can tell you, having actually um, looked a little deeper into some of the class size numbers, um, 20 of the 25 largest classes um, in, our, in Henrico County, uh, 20 of the 25 largest class and their core classes are actually at my schools in the Brooklyn District. So, um, I would appreciate this being a uh, budget priority going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kinsella. Um, Ms. Atkins or Ms. Shea? Um, I cannot agree with what Ms. Ogburn said anymore, um, as well as Ms. Kinsella. I think it is absolutely imperative that we look at these class size numbers and really what our maximum number is uh, and look into having a countywide cap. Um, as a classroom teacher, you know, I've taught the same course with 20 students and with 35 students, and that is a fundamentally different experience for those children in that class. Not only the quality of instruction I can provide each one, but the actual pedagogy and the actual instructional methods I'm able to effectively run my class with. And so I, I think about our teachers there, and as, we, as they're reaching towards the deeper learning model and the HLP, are we setting up them up for success when they have 33, 35 kids in their class. Um, and it, there are budget implications and, and, it, and it's not gonna be something that happens overnight because not only do we have to have the money for it, we have to have building space to put our students in and we have to be able to retain enough teachers to be able to have highly qualified teachers at the front of each room. So it's, there's a lot of arms to it. It's gonna take a multi, pronged approach, but I think it's imperative that we start those conversations about, you know, the SOQ budgeting to 35. Well, I think at Henrico we can do better. And so making sure that every child in Henrico has access to appropriately sized classrooms so that they can have access to all the resources and opportunities that other students do. Thank you. Do you want to add something? So, First and foremost, uh, when we go back in history and we think about our classrooms and our schools, class sizes wasn't even a topic. And I think that it's a remarkable job to move forward in a place where we can look and say in an elementary school level that we have 15. Um, so that's kudos to, to you and your staff because it's important, number one, to start with the conversation and back it up with the facts and then move forward with implementation. Also, I, I echo what my colleagues are saying here too when it comes to class sizes where there will always be state and federal mandates. I also think that Henrico, we have our own way as well. And so I, I can't express enough the need to move forward seriously in the conversations as we talk about class sizes and the impact that it has on our children right now and for the future as well. I'll close with saying one thing that I am interested in getting additional information on is as we look at planning development, I also think we need to look at the timeliness of the developments that are happening. So one thing I'd like to take a look at is we know these things are coming. We can't predict accurately how that's going to impact Henrico County, but what we can do is look at a timeline as to when we anticipate these impacts. So I'd love to see, as you're in discussion with planning, um, some of the date stamp things where they plan on beginning and estimate it on ending. And let's take a look and, and when we're having our conversations, couple that with some of the other work that's taking place. So I'd love, love to see that. Thank you. 
I want to thank you all for your comments and again, Dr. Tigan, for your Herculean task as far as um, taking from 33 to 15. I think that says that when we are very intentional about you know, a goal, we are able to implement the steps necessary. So I do think that everything that's been shared um, from my colleagues that we are well able to not only meet it but exceed it and then therefore again be the regional and, and state um, leader as far as innovation and implementation. So thank you so much to you and to you as well, Dr. Caswell. Thank you. Appreciate it, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. And cer certainly we've um, taken, your, taken note of your feedback and we'll look forward to doing some research related to um, potential um, HCPS caps and what the implications might be both on funding and space and provide you some information to continue that conversation. All right, uh, for the next item, um, Sherry Gimple has come forward as she is going to share with you some proposed revisions to chapter two um, which is entitled School Board Bylaws of the Henrico County Policies and Regulations Manual. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Cashwell. As detailed in Amy's passport, policies are to be reviewed and or revised to ensure that they're current, transparent, and easily accessible to employees and community stakeholders. Chapter two, school board bylaws, has been reviewed and updated as part of the newly formed review process. Because chapter two is specific to laws governing the school board, the review and updates to this chapter were conducted by the school board attorney and policy specialist and reviewed by DLT. The recommended changes can be summarized in several ways. References to Associated Virginia School Board Association or VSBA policies are being added to existing policies. These additions do not change the content of the policy. Similarly, legal references are being added where applicable, and these additions do not change content of the policy. Older policies have been updated to mirror VSBA policy per the requirement to review or update policy every five years. The meaning or intent of the policy content has not changed in most cases. A few policy edits have been recommended by the school board attorney to ensure proper wording and efficiency. And moving forward, reviews of blocks of policy such as this will be conducted by a standing committee on an annual basis, resulting in recommendations to the school board for review and approval. There will continue to be ad hoc policy changes based on changes in law or best practice. I know you had an opportunity to review the changes to chapter two prior to today's meeting, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. The changes have been posted and they will be posted for public comment before final approval at the February 27 school board meeting. Can I answer any questions about proposed changes to chapter two? Thank you, Ms. Gimbel. You all have had an opportunity to review the policies. I'm gonna look to my left to my colleagues. Any questions, comments? I just want to thank you uh, for your meticulous work. Um, it is meticulous work going by policy by policy, um, but but I think it's important um, and that to ensure that our policies really reflect best practices um, and support our teachers and students. And so I know this is just the first chapter, literally, of many or the second chapter of many chapters to come. Um, so thank you, thank you for that meticulous work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ogburn. Um, I have. One quick question. Um, first of all, I couldn't agree with Marcy anymore, but knowing that I'm going to be on this committee with you, I, I do want to ask, page nine says there are no standing committees of the school board, but we do have a committee's list that we all serve on. Are those not considered standing committees? Page nine, Page nine it, the committees a, of the school board. There should be no standing committees of the school board. Because I've worn that. I, I'm happy to jump in if yeah, you want me to. Thank you. I'm sure this is semantics, but it I'm is. Really just so curious. standing committees of the board, those are advisory committees. The standing committees means a subcommittee of this board. Oh, okay. So if there were three of you, for instance, as a disciplinary committee. Gotcha. Or, right. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification. My only question. Okay. I was very excited to get this done while he was still here. I don't blame you. <laughs> Ms. Kinsella, anything? Yes, I just had a minor detail to ask you about on page 46, where we mention an assistant superintendent. We may want to align it with our new organizational chart. Thank you very much. I believe I've already changed that in our other one, but thank you for bringing that up. 
proof positive that we actually read this stuff. Yes, I love I it. I mean, really, we get yeah. kudos for that. I, I could have said I put that in there deliberately just to <laughs> check to see if you did your homework. Um, thank you so much, Ms. Gilbert, Ms. Thank Madam you. Superintendent. Thank you. All right, seeing no other questions, uh, the final item I'm bringing forward this afternoon um, is a brief update on the redistricting process. And Mr. Sorensen's up once more just to share where we are in the process and offer you an opportunity to ask any questions you may have. Mr. Sorensen. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell, members of the board. So, uh, of course, we haven't had any meetings since I updated you last time, but did want to walk through a couple things uh, related to the schedule. So the elementary committee will meet on February 4th at Hungry Creek Middle School at 530. The following night on the 5th, the secondary committee will meet at New Bridge uh, also at 530. There's now also a new joint committee meeting scheduled for February 6th. That will be at Henrico High School and that will start at 530 as well. And of course, a lot of the discussion will focus on the maps that were posted last night as we move forward. Also want to point out that we've recently scheduled a joint committee meeting for February 19th at Jackson Davis. And this meeting will start at 6, not 5.30 like the rest, but, but 6. And so that is my update, and I'll be glad to answer any questions you guys have. I'll start to my right, anybody on my right? Yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Sorison. Yes, sir. Thank you. Madam Superintendent. All right, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, that concludes items from the superintendent. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Superintendent. That being said, um, board members, is there any unfinished business that we need to revisit? Is there any new business that we need to address? All right, that being said, um, I wanna announce our next upcoming meeting, which happens to be tonight at uh, 6.30 p.m. here at the New Bridge Learning Center Auditorium. That being said, um, this meeting is adjourned.